Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin tonight in the Northwest Territories, where not only do evacuees who are fleeing their homes want to know when they will be able to go home, they also want to know whether they can expect ice jam flooding every spring from now on. There are water levels there not seen since the 1960s. Daryl Stranger has more. Darlene Lamb only had a few minutes to flee the floodwaters, quickly encroaching her beloved home on Vail Island, Hay River, Northwest Territories. Grabbing stuff, went running out the door, and by the time I got to the truck, the water was everywhere. That's how fast it came. Around 400 residents live on Vail Island on the east side of town. This year, they've seen extreme flooding caused by high water levels and ice jams along the Hay River. The various sections of town began evacuating over the last few days and on Wednesday evening with a risk of downed power lines and swift moving ice and water, the entire town of just over 3,000 has been ordered to evacuate. Well, I didn't want to leave, <laughs> but uh, the mayor called me and uh, I could hear it in her voice that she like was urging me to leave and that, you know, there was all that ice that's frozen and packed and there's a heck of a lot of water coming still. And once that water hits the ice or whatever and it goes, we don't know what direction it's going to go. The nearby Dene communities of Catlodeche First Nation and West Point First Nation are also under evacuation notice, with elders and families going to the local wellness center. But according to membership, space is limited and not everyone has a place to stay. Because uh, there's, there's no room anywhere. Oh. So there's no room at the treatment center? Uh, I'm not sure about the DCI, but I know those people there too. But we had a choice either to uh, stay at home, so because there's no room at the at the, uh, the old treatment center. Emotions ran high at a town hall meeting on Tuesday. Every year we get evacuated, and you see there's no exit, but we know there's an exit for from at the end of the channel going to the airport. The turnout was in the hundreds. Is there more information, real-time information that we as citizens may have more access to, to plan accordingly? You know, I've got a farm of 118,000 birds and it's a rather big operation that I've got to make a lot of stage uh, decisions based on probabilities. Residents here say there's been a lack of communication and question why the town wasn't better prepared when they knew they were at risk of flooding this year. Is there any policy that's going to be in place with regards to like sandbagging the current or at-risk properties? When it comes to the monitors on the river, my understanding is some of them weren't quite, they're a little erroneous readings. I was personally using those to read, to kind of read what was coming. Town officials say the town so far has $1.4 million from the feds for disaster mitigation and adaptation fund but most will go to repairs, and the new projects would require new money. The realities of forecasting uh, ice jams and the, the predictability of that, those situations in the rivers really, really aren't developed. Beatrice Lapine, an elder who has lived in town her whole life, says leadership needs to consult with locals who have suggestions. We could raise that road and create a partial berm. I'm glad I got you all here because people are talking about it as a practical way. For Lamb, as her community slips underwater, she just hopes everyone is updated in real time. I got like so many people messaging me, um, like in phone calls, uh, Facebook, whatever, just to, because they start finding out that I'm still there and that they want to know how is their house doing. They just need information and it's not getting out. Um, I can understand the town and that's busy, but even if they hired somebody that's on ground zero that's there and said, you know, can you get this information out for us? People would volunteer. They just have to ask for it, mm -hmm. you know, so people are really frustrated. As breakup continues and many parts of the river are still blocked with ice, the situation could get worse before it gets better. Daryl Stranger, EPTN National News. 
to Ontario now, where a new drop-in centre in Hamilton has opened its doors and it's badly needed by Indigenous peoples in the city who require housing support. APTN's Annette Francis met with an Iroquois man who is thankful for the program. This new drop-in centre in downtown Hamilton has been a life changer for Larry Simpson. It's just been nothing but greatness here. Due to a serious back injury three years ago, Simpson says his life spiraled out of control and he became homeless. He couch surfed and lived on the streets for the past three years. Boy, oh boy, I'll tell you, on some of the coldest nights, uh, I, I was in some really predicaments where I was covered up with bags and really um, keeping it keeping it tight. but. The weather is so real, and um, but I prayed and I and I and I said to myself, I will get out of this. Um, you know, he did get out of it with the help from people here at the Hamilton Regional Indian Center's Indigenous Drop-in, which opened its doors on March 1st. Aside from offering a safe space to connect with peers and three meals a day, the center offers a housing and support program. Cheryl Green is the program manager. She says they've helped to house 35 households, but more is needed. So, you know, we, we have been out there trying to create those partnerships to increase availability to housing stock, but there's still absolutely not enough. Um, the housing crisis, you know, which I'm sure is everywhere, not just in Hamilton, but that is the biggest barrier in us being able to support our clients. According to the center's executive director, Audrey Davis, 23% of Hamilton's homeless population are Indigenous. That's why the city of Hamilton has committed 20% of its homeless budget to the organization. Housing isn't the root cause of Indigenous people's issues. It goes back to the historic traumas, right? And being able to get people in a place because they can't get over their addictions, over their mental health concerns, they can't stabilize in a job, um, they can't have a healthy family life if they don't have a roof over their head, right, and a secure roof that they know they're going to have next month and the month after. That's why Simpson considers himself lucky. With the help of the center, he'll be moving into a new bachelor apartment in July. For now, he's in a rooming house. I can't wait. I can't wait. I have a beautiful little cat named Sookie. Um, somebody's taking care of her right now. And I can't wait to get her back because, um, you know, she's a part of my, um, she's a part of my uh, mental health for me. Um, some, something that um, we just have a great relationship, me and Sookie. So. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Hamilton. Yes, absolutely. So what happens when your town's only ambulance gets into a car accident? First Nations paramedics of Ganasatage Mohawk Territory found out the hard way after a car ran a stop sign and crashed into the vehicle, causing their services to be interrupted. And as Amelia Fournier explains, they've been trying to secure a backup vehicle for over a decade that holds in the radiator and that gives the front support to the to the bumper is all uh, is all broken and has to be all replaced. It's Rob Bonspiel is showing us the before. damage on First Nations Paramedics or FNPs only vehicle at a mechanic shop in Oka. Well, we started to call her Bessie because she's starting to get a little bit older, uh, and it and and, and it is in more of a, an in-house joke than anything else. But uh, she served the community very well. They want to keep her as a backup and buy a new ambulance. But first, FNP needs a permit to use Bessie as a secondary vehicle. This Indigenous-owned emergency service serves the Mohawk community of Ganasatage and neighboring communities about 60 kilometers west of Montreal. If the provincial dispatching system needs an ambulance in, for instance, Two Mountains or St. Eustache, and we're the closest resource, we will respond. On May 2nd, two days after the accident, they borrowed a vehicle from Padaxion, then one from Cambi, two ambulance providers. This one is, is functional, meets our, require, uh, meets our needs in the short term for the community. There's a solidarity between these services uh, because they understand individually what we have to do uh, to maintain services in our communities. Paramedic Steve Simon had to scramble to return Padaxion's ambulance when the service needed their vehicle back last minute. When we were done with our patient, we had to go 
with the ambulance to uh, Grenville to pick up this ambulance from Can B, transfer our stuff, and then go to uh, it's near Mochambla to the, their headquarters, give them back their ambulance, and then come all the way back. FNP was out of service for over five hours. Severe accidents like this one are pretty rare, but routine vehicle maintenance is not. We have no choice but to go out of service when uh, we have mechanical issues. When this happens, response times from other ambulance services can take upward of 25 minutes. Quebec's Ministry of Health said they had denied a request from FNP to fund a new ambulance, and FNP hadn't officially requested a backup vehicle permit. But Bonspiel said they've placed five requests for a backup permit over the past decade. The Minister of Health uh, and the Minister of Indian Affairs uh, have come and basically said that they understand our concerns and we've been told that things are going to change. However, they haven't given us a deadline and haven't told us what that change will be. The Quebec Health Ministry said FNP's latest request for permit submitted earlier this week is pending approval. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, OCA, Quebec. We're always looking for your feedback on anything you see here. Here's how you can continue that conversation. You can send your emails to us at news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. An investigation into boarding schools in the United States has been released. Details on that and more coming up after the break. Welcome back. The United States government has released the initial findings of an investigation into federally run Indian boarding schools. Similar to Canadian residential schools, the 408 schools operated between 1819 and 1969 in 37 different states. For more, we're joined by the anchor and producer of Indian Country Today, Aliyah Chavez. Aliyah, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Great to be back. Uh, can you give us a little background on the uh, U.S., uh, the federal Indian boarding schools? Sure. So federal Indian boarding schools started with a piece of legislation, the Indian Civilization Act in 1819. Oh, and of course, Jim this made a light federal boarding schools. But before the that, there, of course, were boarding schools that were run by churches or other religious Everything institutions. So it really wasn't until 1819 that in terms of the well, U.S. Well, government well, funding well, and um, operating Operating these schools that it started happening um, as I'm sure is true for many indigenous folks in Canada um, so many native people in the United States have stories of um, you know their grandmothers or grandfathers who were taken from the from these from their communities and placed into these schools and of course um, we always knew anecdotally that there was really traumatic things that happened at these boarding schools and so now this investigation by the Interior Department is really um, validating what Indigenous people have known for hundreds of years already. Yeah, Aaliyah, what can you tell us about some of the findings from this report? Sure. So this report is over 100 pages long. It's 106 pages, actually. Um, and it's what we know is the first volume. So we assume that to mean that there's going to be more volumes. We're not quite sure how many at this point. Um, but essentially what it found is that there were um, a total of 408 federally um, federal boarding schools from the years 1819 to 1969, which is about a 150 year time period. And um, these schools were located across uh, 37 states, I believe, and that, uh, that includes Alaska and Hawaii, which were territories of the United States at the time. They weren't formally given statehood yet. Um, but so far, what we know is that, um, you know, we have maps of where these schools were located. They were located across various states. Um, and then we also, from the report, learned what kinds of uh, conditions that Native children had to endure at these schools, which, as I just mentioned, are a lot of the same things of Native children being taken forcefully from their homes, but also um, other things like like uh, given white names instead of their traditional names in their native languages. Um, native kids had their hair cut. And there was a number of other um, horrible conditions that these Native kids had to face at these schools. 
Very similar to uh, north of the border here. Um, well, Leah, what, what has been the reaction to the findings and the release of this report? I'd say there's been a big mix of reaction. There's been everything from a lot of sorrow and a lot of weeping. Um, we've heard from boarding school survivors who have said that this felt like opening wounds for them. Um, ICT spoke they to a, a woman yesterday who said that when she was at boarding school, it was the loneliest she ever felt in her life. Um, on the same token, however, we also heard these survivors say that um, they felt really hopeful because um, on the mainstream news channels here in the United States, we're seeing uh, news organizations actually covering this. And what's really funny is that for Native people, this is um, a chapter in our history that is so prominent and so big. And yet a lot of everyday Americans, a lot of everyday non-Native Americans um, didn't know about this. And this is the first time that they're really learning about it. I saw a lot of discourse on social media yesterday. And so it really seems like, um, you know, the dominant American culture is finally realizing what happened. Important and sure. Uh, Aaliyah, just quickly here, like you say, it's volume one. Uh, what are the next steps in all of this? Sure. Well, federal officials are calling for the United States Congress to provide more funding so that they can continue this research. I know specifically that federal officials have called for um, wanting more information about burial sites of Native children who could have, um, you know, died at these uh, boarding schools. And then in addition to that, Interior Secretary Deb Holland has announced that she will be um, conducting a road to healing tour, which basically means she'll be traveling around the country, uh, meeting directly with survivors and talking to them about their experiences. Leah, we'll have to leave it there. Appreciate this. We'll be watching Indian Country today for the latest. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Closer to home, a funeral was held in Saskatoon yesterday for a well-known and celebrated Indigenous educator. Cecil King died last Wednesday at the age of 90. King founded the Indian Teacher Education Program at the University of Saskatchewan. King grew up on Manitoulin Island in Ontario, and he was the first ever director of Aboriginal teacher education at Queen's University. He received numerous awards and recognition for his work, including an Aboriginal Achievement Award in education in 2009. One of the first students of the Indian education program was Judy Pelly. The retired educator says she doesn't know what direction her life would have taken if not for King. He had quite the cohort with us, with those first first uh, 30, or I believe it was 30 of us. And we were all adult learners, adult admission, a lot of us fresh off the reserve. And, and, and uh, of course, that intergenerational trauma, many of us were already drinking quite a bit and partying a lot and going to the bars every weekend. So it was tough. But you know what? He, he stuck by us. He, he kept us, like even me, I, I wanted to give up a couple times because I was a single parent mom. And he encouraged me and, and, and I said, you can do this. You and our condolences to his friends and family. We've got to step aside for one more quick break, but stick around. There's more to come. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And take a peek at this one. Uh, Lori Montague sent us this amazing shot of a sunset over Lake Huron from the shoreline along Kettle and Stony Point First Nation in southern Ontario. We want to see your amazing photos, so send them to us by email to share at aptn.ca and your photo might just be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's soggy forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 20 in Halifax, 29 for Fredericton. Plus 6 with rain in Kuduak, 7 in Nain. 30 above in Montreal, 26 in Chibugumu. 26 with rain in Sault Ste. Marie, 30 in Sunny in North Bay. 23 with rain in Thunder Bay, 24 and showers in Sioux Lookout. 15 with rain in God's Lake, 7 and cloudy in Churchill. Cloudy and 14 for Winnipeg, rain and 13 in Dauphin. 16 with rain in Regina, showers and 14 in Saskatoon. 15 in Meadow Lake, 10 with showers in La Ronge. 
In northern Alberta, 18 with rain in Fort McMurray, 16 in showers in Grand Prairie, 14 with rain in Medicine Hat, 10 in Lethbridge. Rain and 12 for Vancouver, showers and 16 in Kamloops, 16 with rain in Fort Nelson, 11 and rain in Prince George. 12 and sunny skies in Whitehorse, 11 for Watson Lake, sunny and 14 in Yellowknife, 19 in Fort Simpson. Plus one in Saks Harbor, eight above in sunny in Politech, minus three in Chesterfield, two above in Whale Cove, minus four in Resolute, snow and three below in Arctic Bay. In just a matter of minutes, Brett Forrester will be here with the latest episode of Nation to Nation. But first, here he is with a look ahead. Brett. Thanks, Winnipeg. Earlier this week, an MP challenged RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky over racial double standards in policing. The NDP's Matthew Green went head-to-head -head with Lucky during a House Committee on the Emergencies Act. He joins me for an update. Then we'll examine the trouble with Quebec's new proposed language law, Bill 96. First Nations in the province are coming out strong against it. Finally, I'll interview a Cree woman who was coerced into being sterilized and shared her story with the Canadian Senate last week. That's all coming up in just a few minutes. Thanks, Brett. Tomorrow night on APTN Investigates, Christopher Reed meets with a BC hereditary chief who's trying to return a totem pole to his community. The pole is currently at the Royal BC Museum, where the chief says it doesn't belong. Here's a preview. Decolonizing museums is something we've looked at previously on Investigates. It's the idea of correcting the bias of the colonial lens, the lens that has tended to see cultures other than white ones as just that, other. It's a big idea that has museums across Canada and around the world taking a hard look at what they've been. And it's impacting how museums will be operated moving forward. But decolonizing museums isn't just about changing the way museums look at things. It's also very much about retrieving possessions that were taken. Yeah, my name is uh, Hereditary Chief Shluki It means brightness of daylight. The chief is trying to get the Royal British Columbia Museum to return a totem pole he says belongs to his family. You know, our traditions, things um, weren't meant to, meant to be standing 100, 150 years. I don't know exactly what the museum has done to these totem poles to make them stand so long, but it's against our traditional law for them to be, for them to be doing that. And you can watch that latest episode of APTN Investigates right here tomorrow night after the news. That's all the time we have for your AP10 National News for this Thursday. Of course, for news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. Nation to Nation with Brett Forrester is up next. Have a great night.